Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Dawson, and today we are going to talk about a disease called Cushing's disease. Now, I apologize for my voice. It's probably a little bit off as I have been kind of dealing with a little bit of a head cold and a few other things here in, in my life at the moment. So just please be patient with that. But in a previous video, we talked about Addison's disease. Now, both of these diseases, Addison's and Cushing's disease, deal with a particular hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is specifically a hormone that deals with stress and it helps the body to deal with stress. And Addison's disease is when the body has none of this hormone, another hormone called aldosterone, which is very closely related to it. Cortisol is a very important hormone when we're talking about dealing with different types of stress. It could be pain, it could be trauma, it could be cold exposure, it could be quite a few different types of stress. We could be talking about physical stress, we could be talking about emotional stress in humans and uh, I believe in dogs and cats and other animals as well. Now the pathway that starts the production of this hormone, cortisol, starts out in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is basically the nervous system's connection to the endocrine system. Basically the endocrine system is the system that deals with hormones, their production, their pathways, their signaling capabilities, and this affects most of the body's health because it affects energy metabolism, it affects reproduction, it affects growth, it affects so many different things for the body's normal function. Now the hypothalamus is stimulated by the, the rest of the nervous system to start to produce a hormone that is going to signal the next part of the chain, the pituitary gland, which is also a gland that produces many different hormones, and it's also in the brain, or it's actually just below the brain uh, in the body. And so the hypothalamus is gonna produce a hormone that is going to talk to the pituitary gland and tell the pituitary gland, hey, we need more cortisol because we're stressed out. And then the pituitary gland is going to send another hormone called ACTH to the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland is a very important part of the body. It produces many different hormones that signal quite a few different things, including cortisol, uh, reproductive hormones, including progesterone, and some testosterone, estrogens, all of those things, as well as aldosterone. This adrenal gland, which sits over the kidneys, is going to release cortisol as a result of the pituitary gland saying, hey, we need more. So there's several different ways that Cushing's disease can manifest. So Cushing's disease, again, is when there's too much of this stress hormone called cortisol. It can either be a result of the pituitary gland saying, hey, we need more cortisol when it actually doesn't, or it could be a result of the adrenal gland going rogue and just producing lots and lots of cortisol for no apparent reason, even though the rest of the body is saying, hey, we have enough, and it just says, nah, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going, bro, and they just keep producing more and more cortisol. The two main types of Cushing's disease are pituitary dependent, which is the most common. This is about 70 to 80% of Cushing's cases in dogs, and it basically is a result of a small, very, very tiny pituitary gland tumor. Now, this tumor is usually microscopic, and it produces lots and lots of the hormone that says, hey, we need more cortisol, and then the adrenal gland, in response to this constant stimulation, starts to basically get larger. And so it, that part of the adrenal gland gets larger and continues to produce more and more cortisol. The second type is a, an adrenal tumor. And this is typically a benign tumor that is going to produce excess cortisol as part of its process of just getting larger. It doesn't respond to negative stimulus, meaning that it doesn't respond to the body saying, hey, bro, we've got enough. And it just kind of keeps doing its thing and doesn't really care. So now that we know a little bit about the two types of Cushing's disease, let's talk a little bit about what the symptoms are because the symptoms are gonna be consistent no matter which type of Cushing's disease you have, or at least most of the time, and I'm not gonna get into the fine details and all the scientific papers. Now we talked a little bit about where and why cortisol is used. It's usually a result of some sort of stress. 
but it affects many different body systems. So it affects everything from the liver, it affects the nervous system, it can affect the growth hormone uh, whole cycle for younger animals, which doesn't happen very often. It affects the skin and it can affect so many different parts of the body. And so when we have an excess of this hormone, we a lot of times will start to see symptoms that are affecting many different parts of the body. So if your dog does have Cushing's disease, a lot of times they're going to have a pot-bellied appearance, they're going to have a lack of hair, so they're gonna either have thinning hair or it's gonna be super brittle or slow growing. We could see pigment changes in the skin, very thin skin, sometimes an apparent weight gain, even though a lot of times they don't actually gain weight, a loss of muscle mass, fat redistribution, a whole bunch of different things. Sometimes your dog will be more tired. Sometimes they may pant a lot. And once your dog starts to show these symptoms, it could be months or even years before the owner is even gonna notice that. And it's not because you guys aren't diligent. It's just because you look at the dog every single day and most of these changes are extremely slow to happen. And one of the other things is, is that sometimes people just think, oh, my dog's just getting old when in fact, it's an endocrine disease like Cushing's. Sometimes one of the other things that it gets confused with is diabetes mellitus, which is just diabetic, which is just diabetes or a type of diabetes. And it's the most common one in dogs because a lot of times they'll have a lot of the similar things. They're not gonna be themselves. They might pant, they're gonna have urinary accidents. A lot of times we can see very similar symptoms between the two diseases. So if you think your dog has Cushing's disease, what's the next step? Well, your vet's gonna wanna run several different tests. And the first one is going to be a general chemistry and CBC. And this is just to one, rule out other diseases such as you know diabetes mellitus or other diseases like liver disease. Um, and also it's going to point them in the direction, yes, it's more likely Cushing's. And once they've been pointed in that direction of yes, more likely Cushing's disease, they're going to one, want to run some tests to confirm yes, it's Cushing's, but two, they're going to want to classify what type of Cushing's disease it is. Because it's very important for treatment to make sure that we're treating for the right type of Cushing's disease, since the way they produce the excess cortisol is very different. So for a dog that has an adrenal tumor, surgical removal is probably going to be the best option of that tumor. Now, in a dog that has a pituitary tumor, that surgery is extremely complex and we find that it can affect a lot of different systems because that surgery a lot of times is just removal of the whole pituitary gland. And it's a very high risk surgery because of where it at, is at in the body and it's not a good option. But we can treat the adrenal tissue that is producing the excess cortisol in such a way that it's able to slow down production that doesn't work with, doesn't work, or at least doesn't work as well with an adrenal dependent tumor. If we do in fact find that it's a pituitary dependent Cushing's disease, then most likely we're going to wanna to treat it medically. And there's two different medications that we often use, and that's mitotane and trilostane. Now, trilostane tends to be a little less permanent uh, because it doesn't kill off the tissues most of the time, but it tends to sometimes have as many or more side effects than mitotane. Mitotane will kill off a lot of the tissue that is producing the cortisol, and it's somewhat irreversible, but not really. And that one does definitely carry some risks but both of them have a place and both of them have been used with great success in Cushing's disease. So your vet, based on their personal experience and based on your dog's presentation, may choose one or the other. So a dog with Cushing's disease, is it a death sentence? No. Uh, there's actually a old saying that a dog with Cushing's disease left untreated will die the same time as a dog with Cushing's disease that was treated. However, I don't necessarily think that's true. There haven't been studies that have proven that, but a dog can live for a very long time with Cushing's disease. However, their quality of life often is very drastically affected and they don't live nearly as well. I mean, think about if you just went to the bathroom in places you weren't supposed to all the time, 
or if you just were fat and sluggish and couldn't move and you lost muscle mass for no apparent reason and just started putting fat on everywhere. That doesn't sound like a very fun lifestyle and it, it really doesn't sound like a very fun time. Nor do they tend to be healthy because we can see effects on the liver. We can see effects on other parts of the body as a secondary result of having Cushing's disease. So treating Cushing's disease if your dog has it most of the time is going to be the best option. There definitely are some very, very mild cases of Cushing's disease that may not need to be treated and could very well go untreated with very little change, but those are definitely the minority. So if your dog has Cushing's disease, or if you think it does, definitely seek some veterinary care. Definitely go to your vet and let them run the tests that they need to run so they can choose the best treatment protocol for your animal. As always guys, thank you so much for supporting the channel and watching this video. The next few videos are hopefully going to be talking about some rabbit stuff. Um, and I also want to start diving in a little bit into YouTube shorts. I'm not exactly sure what type of content I'll put on there, but it will probably be interesting. So hopefully you enjoy it. We'll see you guys in the next video. Have a fantastic rest of your day.